Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Thursday, everybody. Listen, how many of y'all know that you have made it throughout this week? It's almost over. And for that, you should be rejoicing. If you know that you couldn't have made it without the Lord, I need you to just wave your hands right here and just give a clap to the Lord. We're going to sing one song really quickly. We're going to get out of your way. It's a song that everybody knows, and I just encourage you to stand up to your feet and just worship.
Thank you, God, for bringing us to Thursday. Thank you, God, for bringing us over papers and homework assignments and quizzes and exams. Father, thank you for bringing us thus far. Thank you, God, for last night was not our last night. And so, Father, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would fall in this chapel service. May our hearts be satisfied with your love. And may our praise and our worship be acceptable in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Oakwood. Uh, that wasn't everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Oakwood. It is a pleasure to see your smiling face. As I begin to make one announcement, I want to ask the certain people that would be coming up to make specific announcements to come on up. But in case you didn't know, today from 11 to 3, the 5th Annual Community Health Fair will take, will take place at the MAC. So if you have class, if you don't have class, if you can find the time to go visit, make your way over there, there's going to be prizes, there's going to be food, there's going to be gifts. So if you want to go over there, make the time. Again, that's from 11 to 3 p.m. at the MAC. It's the 5th Annual Community Health Fair. At this time, we will have a couple of announcements. Good morning, Oakwood. So I am in charge of Ignite. My name is Amalia, for those who do not know. And um, this week, or this month, we've had the great opportunity to have freshman speakers. We've had AJ, Joy, um, Frankie, and Sophia. And so to wrap up this week of October, which is faith, we are going to be having a worship experience held by our praise teams and our drama. So I invite you guys all to come out. Um, it is going to be at a different time and a different place. It is going to be at 6 p.m., 6 p.m. at the BT building. And so you will see flyers up for that, but 6 p.m. at the BT building. Hope to see you there. So this AY, we have AY here at the church at 8 p.m. Next AY, we have AY here at 7 p.m. So if you come at 8, you're going to miss half the program. Reason being, Todd Delaney will be in concert. He will be starting the concert at 7, but the doors open at 6. So if you come at 8, you miss half of the thing. But next AY, November 10th, we'll be having AYM at First Church, not Oakwood University Church. First Church. Why? Because NBC will be here to film a Christmas edition. And so this entire place will be filled with cameras. So we have to move location to First Church. All right? So First Church, 8 p.m., I'll see you there. All right, good morning, everyone. All right, so um, recently there was a um, social media buzz with the hashtag MeToo. Guys, remember that? And so next Wednesday, we are going to be having a candid conversation, ladies only, at the Media Center at 7 p.m. next Wednesday, and it will be called Me Too. We want to invite all of our ladies out to have a very just open, honest conversation um, about, about women, feminism, about the experiences that we've had as women in the church and our homes growing up so that we can start doing some healing. Amen? Amen. So we want to invite you all next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Media Center for our small group entitled Me Too. Hey family, we want to thank everyone who came out to sign up for our international missions on last week, Wednesday and Thursday. And so we're going to have our interest meeting this coming Wednesday night after prayer meeting beginning at 8 p.m. in Carter Hall Chapel. If you didn't have a chance to come by the table, you can come by to the interest meeting and hear the, the, the different locations we'll be going to. And if you're interested, you can sign up there and begin receiving information so that you can start fundraising. So 
So next week, Wednesday after prayer meeting, Carter Hall Chapel, 8 p.m. We'll see you there. All right, good morning, everybody. Okay, good morning, everybody. All right, uh, we are the Life Court team. For those who don't know what Life Court is, Life Court is a survey that we put out throughout the campus to uh, gauge the spiritual atmosphere and the spiritual life and your spiritual growth from your freshman year to your senior year. And we want to give you an incentive to take the survey, all right? So we have a gift. Uh, we're going to pull a name for the students. We're going to pull two names for faculty and staff to incentivize you to uh, take the survey. If you have already taken the survey, your name doesn't leave the bowl. But everyone who has not taken the survey, you want your name in the bowl because we got some crazy gifts to give away. Today we're giving away a Beats pill to the students. Gotta mix it up. Yeah, it. Oh, Beats headphones, sorry. Beats headphones. Beats headphones. Oh, you must be present in chapel to win. And you must have your ID to verify your identity, all right? You must be present to win, all right? We got our name. Reba Paul. Reba Paul. Are you present in chapel, Reba? Give it up for Reba, give it up. Reba. I know, she's right there. But. Okay, here's your gift. Miss Kenny, can you raise your hand? Go see her. All right, good job, Reba. Reba, 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 real quick, real, real quick. How long did it take you to do the Life Course survey? Less than five minutes. Less than five minutes, and now she has Beats headphones. Less than five minutes to take the survey. You can find the survey in your Oakwood email or on the Oakwood website. Now for faculty and staff. Faculty and staff, you must be in chapel. The campus is supposed to shut down anyway for chapel, so you must be here to win. Kirk Nugent. Kirk Nugent, are you present? Oh, okay, they said next. <laughs> Brutal. All right, next name, next name. Okay. Armand Blankenship. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> Andrew Pileggi. <laughs> Andrew Pileggi. Chaplain Pileggi, you just won yourself a $50 gift card to a special place. All right. <laughs> I want something from Apple. I just want to go on a... Oh, too bad. Okay. Next name, faculty and staff. Delan Russ Sharp. Okay. Tracy Preston. Tracy Preston, are you here? Are you here? John Ruffin. I don't even know who that is. Oh, sorry, sorry. Lakeisha Smith. Oh, faculty and staff got to start coming to chapel. Kanee Moore. Yeah. Miss Kanee. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Looks like we have to do some work with the faculty and staff. Somebody else say amen. But praise the Lord, we got our provost here. We do have some good faculty and staff here. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing to be here. Just want to take a few moments as we before we do our chapel challenge. Just come up and do that. We want to thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your participation. We want to encourage you um, to be involved with the survey. Please, if you have not taken the survey, go on and please take the survey. Students, faculty and staff, we have some wonderful gifts that are planned for you even on next week. Good morning, everyone. The chapel challenge question was, how long did it take Eric Thomas to graduate from Oakwood University? And the answer was 12 years. And the chapel challenge winner is Gabrielle Francis.
Go get her. Then. You can cover up just to take a picture. Thank you. Congratulations, Gabrielle. Amen. We want to invite you up, uh, Dr. Halloran Hill, Hilton Triple H. Amen, somebody. So glad to have Triple H with us this morning. I just want to welcome you home. He's a graduate of Oakwood University, and we're so glad to be able to have you back here at home. So we want to give you some gifts um, and honor you for the work that you are doing in Knoxville and around the country, and also what you're going to do in terms of bringing the, this powerful message today to our students. But welcome to Oakwood University again. Amen. Good morning, Oakwood. I've been asked today to pray. I count it a privilege to pray. Anybody got some really deep things on your heart right now? Raise your hand. I'm here to pray for you, pray for our faculty, our staff, our students, all of our community members. Let's bow reverently together as we seek the Lord in prayer today. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this privilege of prayer. Thank you that we can bring our petitions to you today. We thank you most of all that you see us that you hear us. In spite of our deep sins, Lord, we ask you once, first of all, to cover us once again with the blood of the Lamb, to heal our hearts, and make us saints today so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And so now we do. We're bringing our petitions to you, Lord. So many hearts are broken right now. So many people are hurting right here in this congregation. So Lord, we ask that you would send the bomb of Gilead to heal our sin sick, our heart sick souls, our physically sick souls, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Heal our lands. Give our leaders clarity and wisdom. Bless those who sorrow, those who are suffering, suffering today from the storms and the fires and the earthquakes and the pestilences around the world, the diseases. We ask, Lord, that you would come close to those Bless all these leaders in training here in this congregation, Lord. Please help them to be diligent in their training. Help them as they are not so diligent to get a new fire and to help us, Lord, as we labor along with all of us together, seeking to change this world and to make us to be instruments of your peace. So heal us from our lethargy and our laziness and help us to grow stronger in you. Help us bless our speaker today and help us to feel your Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've spent a lot of time um, stuck on things of the past, stuck on people, things, um, everything. Just think when I, God was trying to call me to move forward because he had something greater for me. So even though it's a Thursday morning, I just want to remind somebody here um, that no matter what you might have gone through in the past, no matter what might be just holding you back, in Christ you can always move forward. So I pray that you're blessed by this song.
Good morning, Oakwood. I know that uh, chapel is mandatory, but your attendance is not. I mean, your attendance is mandatory, but your attention is not. So um, thank you for letting me spend this time with you. Um, if I had to, uh, to give a title to my brief presentation today, it would simply be Joy 101. Joy 101. Um, and it's based on just this simple notion that um, joy doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Uh, there are a lot of people who believe that if, um, if you pulled all of the weeds out of a garden, you would immediately have seeds in the garden. In other words, if you got all the bad stuff out of your life, all the good stuff would just automatically grow. Not true. The good life is one based on intention. And so I want to talk about joy today. First, I want to help you have a little more joy than you have right now. If you would do me a favor, I've done this around the world, and when people do this to and for one another, it makes them feel really good. First, how many of you have ever had a fake hug? You know those church hugs, they're at an angle, kind of like that. Hey. How many of you have ever had a, my grandmother used to give the best hugs in the world. They were typified by being double barrel. She would pull you in close and rock you until all the problems fell Come off. On. Yes, sir. Right? If you would stand on your feet, turn to the person next to you and give them a big mama hug. some good big mamas in here. Hey, big mama. Now, do me a favor. Do me a favor and turn to the person next to you and just say these words, these joy-inducing words, and we'll take it a little bit higher. Turn to the person next to you and say these words. You look good today, baby. this in about 20 minutes. Um, two things I want to say today. Uh, one is enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. And then enjoy your work. Enjoy your work. Um, that's basically what I, what I want to say today. And I want to give you some fuel and then I want to give you some tools some fuel for your spirit, and then some actionable tools that you can use to experience more joy in your life, because that's God's intention for you. I am a nerd. I am a nerd by confession and confirmation. Are there any nerds in the room today? All right. Uh, by the way, you know we're nerds because we're the only people that would raise our hands when somebody says, are there nerds? And that is a nerd move all by itself. But I have a new definition of the word nerd that will thrill you. A nerd is a person that just never found the off switch to their curiosity. Any nerds in the room? <laughs> so when I was growing up, I became fascinated with astronomy. Um, my mother wanted to take me around the world and she wanted to take me around the universe, but we were poor. Um, I don't know if there are any poor people in the room today. You feel me? So she hacked a solution. And all great people will do that. They have a dream, a goal, an aspiration. They don't have the money for it, so they hack a solution. So at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, they had travel films. My mother would get the brochure and we'd go on Sunday and she'd say, this year we're going to China and Russia and in India. We would go around the world for free, but then on the other side of the campus, there was a planetarium. 
and we would tour the universe. And I remember I became enamored with the stars. Looked up and learned the, the Milky Way, and I learned the, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, and I realized we live in a grand universe that was created by a grand God. Take a look at this image right here. This is our little galaxy. It is magnificent. It is called the Milky Way. It is 100,000 light years across. A light year is the distance you could travel in a year if you could travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. Uh, to make it simpler, the speed of light is New York to LA 60 times every time you blink your eye. If you could travel that fast, it would take you 100,000 years to go from one side of our galaxy to the other. But by the time you got there, it wouldn't be there because the entire galaxy is spinning. Now, I bring this up because there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy, of which the sun is an ordinary star. It's 93 million miles away, so big and so hot, you can see it with the naked eye and you can feel it on your skin. And yet it is one of 400 billion, and at that it is ordinary. Imagine this, how much space must there be between the stars if the upper atmosphere is ice cold and it is filled with burning orbs like our sun, 400 billion. The vastness of our galaxy is unimaginable and he did it like this, let there be light. So this is the Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope is about 373 miles above Earth. It travels at about 17,000 miles an hour and it orbits Earth every 96 minutes. And the reason we put a telescope up above the Earth is because the distortion that's created in the upper atmosphere. So sometimes you have to get above the distortion so you can see a little bit better. So we put it up higher so we could see more. And we did see more. This is what we saw. A classic picture called Class B-1608 plus 656. This is that image. Now what they thought they were looking at was a field of stars, but it's a field of galaxies. There are five billion more galaxies like this. This is M101. It's 170 light years across, home to a trillion stars. It has a hundred billion stars the size of our sun. He did it like this, he just said, let there be light. Earth, that beautiful shining orb, it hangs in the sky. It is tethered to the sun by its gravitational force and it is in orbit. God dropped it in space and said, stay. And it turns, it turns. I get up every morning to watch daybreak and I was sitting watching daybreak one morning and I said, okay, here comes the sunrise, the sun is rising. And I heard God say, the sun's not rising, the earth is turning toward the sun on time. You resist me, the earth doesn't. Yeah. On this planet, there's 700, I mean, there's 7.5 billion people now. In the history of the planet, there have been about 100 billion people on the planet, right? 100 billion people have lived here. Here's what's unique about you. And the first thing I want you to know today is how special and significant you are. This, in order to make an individual, you have to have a unique egg and a unique sperm. It has to be that combination and none other. When I was studying biology and chemistry here, I remember studying genetics and Punnett Square and dominant and recessive traits, and I'm sitting there thinking about the only way you could be you was that egg, that sperm. Now, when people come together to try to create that unique combination, it's a one in 400,000 chance per try. We live in a society where people like to try. I'll slow that down. <laughs> so what are the chances of being born? 
They did the math. Here's the numbers. One in 10 to the 2.6 millionth power. And catch this. Every single person in your bloodline had to be exactly who they were, when they were, for you to be here right now, including your crazy uncle. <laughs> if it had been one other person, you wouldn't exist. And every generation beyond this moment is dependent on you. So when somebody says you're one in a million, tell them they shot too low, baby. They shot too low. <laughs> God said, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew you. Out of all of that vastness, he decided to pluck you out and place you here for purpose, on purpose. Know this this morning. You matter. And all of the intelligence that informed the creation of the world is the same intelligence he used to create you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no doubt about that. And by the way, if you feel like there's darkness in your life, anybody feel like you got some darkness in your life? How many of you got a little dirt in your closet? Let me tell you about God. At the beginning of creation, it says, darkness covered the face of the deep, right? And God's spirit was hovering over the darkness, and he spoke to the darkness and said, let there be light. And then he said, and God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Catch this, darkness and dirt are God's starter kit. You bring him darkness, he makes new worlds. You bring him dirt, he makes men and women. Come on. He's always been in the process of formation. He forms us, and then he fills us with his spirit to inform us. And when we go astray, he reforms us, ultimately hoping to transform us. Hey, come on. Yeah. So you matter. And I don't care about the darkness or dirt in your life right now. You serve a God that has infinite intelligence and wisdom, and he is a creator, and he didn't stop there. He is creating now. That's why you're in college. He's creating something out of you, and he wants you to have joy. So let's get going here. Look at this. So one of the toughest parts of my career has been sustaining my enthusiasm for what I do, because you're going to learn to be great at what you do. Uh, you guys are fabulous. You'll make great doctors, lawyers, preachers, teachers, whatever you end up being. You'll be great at that. Trust me. You will have a high skill set. You know what the toughest thing will be? Joy. Maintaining your enthusiasm for what you were called to do. Because the first day you're called and everybody is excited about you and you're growing and you're feeling great, that feels good. But when you hit that first plateau, when you go through the third breakup, when you go through the fifth sickness, when you're at that plateau or your life is on the downswing, where do you find joy? And Solomon found that out because he had everything and he had nothing. By the time he gets to Ecclesiastes, his magnum opus, he says, wait a minute, there's no there there. Vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. There's nothing there. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's no there there. <laughs> <laughs> you think if you get the Rolex presidential and the Wraith and you have a small waist and well, anyway, um, <laughs> now nah. look at what he said though. I found this interesting rhythm in the book of Ecclesiastes because he will go vanity, vanity, it's all vanity, there's nothing there. And then every two chapters or so, and you can go check it out, he has a resolution. There's a positive rhythm. Look at what he says here in 518. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. But look at this. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions, and right here, 
power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. And I love this. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. You dab on that. Is, dab, is dabbing still appropriate? I don't, I don't, that might have been two years ago. <laughs> Linda, I dabbed on that. I did that, and then I, I was cooking it up. And then I... <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it was somewhat Bodak Black. All right, so. Oh, yeah, okay, Bodak Yellow, thank you. Red Pops. <laughs> so let's go. So the first thing I want you to know is joy is medicine. Joy is medicine. Where are my biology and chemistry majors? Right here, okay. So you'll love this. Um, from a chemical standpoint, the body produces a protein called interleukin-6. It drives inflammation. In scientific research, they took a group of people, they divided them by pessimist and optimist, and they gave them the rhinovirus, which causes the common cold, and they wanted to see who got sick, who didn't get sick. Positive, joyful people either didn't get sick or their immune system was so robust that they bounced back faster. Negative, pessimistic people got sicker faster and stayed sicker longer. It turns out that joy is actually like a cure because it suppresses the production of interleukin-6. The science is catching up to what God said 3,000 years ago, joy is medicine. But then joy is strength, check this out. Nehemiah said, go enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those uh, who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. So let's talk about joy. I want to give you some instruction in joy. Let me uh, triple check my time. Let's see where I am on my time. 1045. All right. So we, what, we got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Five. Somebody said five. <laughs> Somebody said five. <laughs> All right, let me knock this out. Quick thing about the brain. So here's what we've learned about the brain. My dad gave me a love for reading, and we loved to read all the time. That was one of his greatest gifts. And I started doing what is called immersive reading. Immersive reading is where you choose a subject, identify the 12 best books on that subject, and then spend a, a year reading. You read a book a month for a year, and you journal as you read, and start started reading about the brain. One of the most exciting things about the brain, is that Dave? What's up, Dave? One of the most exciting things about the, squirrel, <laughs> one of the most exciting things about the brain is neuroplasticity. The brain can change, can reformat itself. So your habitual persistent thoughts create the set of your mind. So it works like this. Take a look at this illustration. You think a thought over and over, and you become locked to that thought. Trigger, and then it follows through. You lay down a neural pathway. What they found is you, you can find a better thought to replace the negative thought, and if you think that more persistently, the old thought starts to weaken, that neural pathway starts to weaken, and this new one becomes your new mindset. The old folks used to call it being set in your ways. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the big news today is that change is possible. Tell your neighbor, change is possible, baby. Got to put baby on it, though. It sticks better. All right. So let me give you this. One big idea, and then I'm going to give you some tools and I'll be done. You are where you are because of your mindset, and you will be where you end up because of your mindset. Here's a secret. It's your mind to set. 
The thoughts that you are repeating in your own minds over and over again really are determining the quality of your life where you are. You thought yourself there. Right. You thought yourself there. Joy doesn't just happen. Joy and well-being is a skill. Scientifically proven, here are a few tools that you can use to raise the level of joy in your life. And how many of you could use more joy in your life? All right, let's go do it. Won't he do it? All right. So I said enjoy your life. The prefix en means to make, cause, or create. So when you decide to enjoy your life, you've decided to move from waiting for joy to creating joy, from passive to active, right? Enjoy your life. So that's what we want to do. We want to practice really good thought hygiene. So here are eight habits that I would like for you to practice for the next six months to raise the level of joy in your life. Here we go. Number one, gratitude. Number one, gratitude. No, I'm not talking about being grateful. When I was listening to the violinist play, what, what's his name again? Patrick, good gracious. I just sat there and I was thanking God for my ears. Just to be able to hear that. Here's what they found in the research. This is how gratitude starts to transform the mind, is when you keep a gratitude journal. So this is what I want you to do every day for the next six months. It has an AM phase and a PM phase. In the morning, I want you to write down three things for which you're grateful. Three things for which you're grateful. And then after that, three things that would make the day great. Three things that would make the day great. At the end of the day, before you close your eyes, I want you to write down three things that went well. Three things that went well. Now, let me tell you why this works this way. You ever had this experience where you get a new car or you get some new clothes or new shoes and you start to see them everywhere? And it's not because there are more of them there than there were the day before. Your awareness of them changes, right? As you practice gratitude, you're going to be on the hunt for more things for which to be grateful. And you're going to see it pop open to you. You're going to be grateful for everything. Like this morning, I was grateful for a hot butt. She said, did he just say a hot butt? Yeah, yeah. It was cold this morning when I left uh, Tennessee, about 4.30 this morning, and I have heated seats in my car. <laughs> Thus the hot butt. All right, let's go. Gratitude. <laughs> Number two, attitude. Turn to your neighbor and say, attitude, baby, attitude. Attitude. Real quick, uh, I have lots of great friends. One of my friends is a fighter pilot. He, for a hobby, he flies a stunt plane. He flies, flies a stunt plane, and he said, hey, would you like to go up in the stunt plane with me? I said, yes, because I like motorcycles, fast cars. I go up, note to anybody going up in a stunt plane, no Taco Bell. No Taco Bell. <laughs> A gastrointestinal nightmare, but that's another story. So I go up, we're flying, and he says, take the controls, jam them to your left leg. So I jam the controls to my left leg, and we start spinning like this. I'm looking out of the windows, and I'm getting disoriented. He is not. I'm looking out the windows, and I'm panicking. He is not. He says to me very calmly, check your attitude. I said, you check your attitude. We're about to die. <laughs> No, when we got in the plane, he told me about this gauge in the plane. That is called the attitude indicator. It shows you the relative position of the wings to the horizon. And when you can't make sense of it out here, gauge, make adjustments until the wings match the horizon, and that's how you stay up. You do two things. You check your attitude, and you fix your attitude to stay up. Turn your neighbor and say, check your attitude, baby. <laughs> fix your attitude. <laughs> so, so here's what I'd like for you to do for the next six months, or maybe just six days. What I'd like for you to do is three times a day, when you get up in the morning, check it, fix it. At noon, over lunch, say your prayer, and then say, how's my attitude? And ask your best friend, how's my, how many of you have a best friend that will tell you the truth? Would you give them permission to check your attitude? 
and then fix it. So check and fix. All right, let's go. Let me knock these down and I'll get out of here. Five, five, five plus one. This is what I call the 1% solution. You should do this every day. 1,440 minutes in a day, 15 minutes is 1% of your day. Do this. Five minutes reading the word, five minutes listening or sitting in meditation, and five minutes in prayer using the Lord's Prayer as your framework. You get the eternal part over with, and then when you get down to the last four petitions, give us this day our daily bread. In that pocket, ask God for everything you need. Forgive us our debt. Ask him to forgive you for whatever needs forgiveness. But then in that pocket also, forgive everyone that has done anything to you wrong every day. Press the clear button every day. That's your freedom. You'll have more joy. Then, lead us not into temptation. What you're asking God to do is put a lasso around your heart and draw you to him. How many of you are fighting temptations? God has promised to lead you away from that. Ask him every day. List the temptations to, hey, I met this girl. We were in the car. We were listening to Kodak, Bodak Yellow. I was feeling some type of way. Do they still say that one? <laughs> Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The deliverance is about being inside that bubble where he protects you from evil. Five, five, five plus one. Here's the next part, Sabbath. Take a day each week to unplug from the things that drain you so you can plug into the things that fill you and absolutely no work, right? Next, ESN. Exercise, sleep, and nutrition. Simple formula, 30 minutes of exercise a day, seven to nine hours of sleep every night. What, what happened? Y'all are not getting sick? No? And then the healthiest, at least one meal a day, I want you to eat the healthiest, most high-octane thing you can eat. So ESN, all of these things scientifically proven to give you greater joy. Next up, positive relationships. Uh, I think it was Reverend Mano that had a song, High Haters. We, <laughs> we, <laughs> We update and we say, bye, haters. Say, bye, haters. Bye. <laughs> you want positive relationships, and these relationships should be built on this ratio right here. Your relationship should be five to one positive. So if you and I are friends, I got to try to give you as much positivity as I can. It does something for you, right? So would you try that for the next six months? Five to one positive. And if you are dating, any, any of you in the room dating? She said, I'm dating Jesus. <laughs> well, let me tell you about Jesus. He will never leave you, yeah. nor forsake you. Come on now, come on now, oh Lord. Somebody ought to get happy to. <laughs> I'm just playing with y'all. <laughs> work. As the uh, prophet Rihanna once said, uh, work, 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 work. <laughs> you should work with joyful excellence. One of the things that will bring more joy to your life is when you finish your work, if you've done it so well that even you can stand back and say, that's good. You should give yourself that satisfaction. It will give you more joy. Number seven, grow. Grow. Every year you should be learning and growing. Not just in college, the rest of your life. Last year I learned to swim. You should learn you should share, share what you know. And then finally, give, give. Find a way to give something away every day. The simplest thing to give is a smile. Give a smile. If you'll try those eight things and we'll make those available to you for the next six months, it is scientifically proven that your mood will lift. If you have depression and anxiety, it will start to lift off of you and you will have joy in your life. Not perfect happiness, but an operating system based on joy. This is what I call Joy 101, and I wish that for you as you enjoy your life and enjoy your work. Thank you, and God bless you.
please stand for our benediction? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us to almost the end of another week. Um, thank you for um, giving us sunshine, even though it's been a little cold. Please help us to take the lessons that we've learned today in um, chapel and in class and throughout the whole week and help us to apply them to our life, help us with our grades, and uh, carry us throughout the rest of the semester. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.